Chapter 3 A Cafe's Owner's Warning Didn't you ask the man what he meant? Louise inquired, taken aback by Penny's disclosure. Certainly I did, Lou. He merely shrugged and said it was his opinion I'd not like the place. Then he meant nothing after all? I'm not sure, Penny said slowly. Perhaps he started to tell me something and changed his mind. Anyway, the question is, shall I tell Laura? She'll never take the job if you do. That's what I figured. Of course, if the place is undesirable, we wouldn't wish her to have it. Why not wait until we learn the outcome of the interview? Perhaps that would be wise, Penny agreed. Laura had paused to wait for her two friends. So the girls quickly overtook her. Shall we wait outside or go inside with you, Penny inquired. You don't mind coming along, Laura said timidly. Not in the least. I wish you would. I dread interviewing with strangers. The three girls led themselves through a dirty picket fence and made their way to the porch. A card in the front window bearing the words, Tourist Rooms, caused Penny to remark that Laura would find plenty of work to do in the house which catered to transients. Louise rang the doorbell and in a moment a lean woman with frowsy hair scorched from a curling iron came to the door. She had a sharp angular face and a large nose which drew attention away from her other imperfect features. Well, she inquired, a note of impatience in her voice. When Laura became confused and could not answer, Penny replied that they were there in response to the advertisement inserted in the Riverview Star. Come in, the woman invited, scrutinizing each of the girls in turn. You're not from White Falls, are you? No, we live in Riverview, Penny replied easily. I'd rather have a girl from somewhere besides White Falls, the woman announced. But I warn you, the work is hard. There's scrubbing and washing and ironing to do. You look rather young to me. Oh, I'm not applying for the position, Penny said hastily. Laura, Laura Blair is the one who's interested. Your name is? Mrs. Anna Comstock, replied the woman, turning to gaze at Laura. She frowned disapprovingly. You're not very strong, are you? I've never been afraid of hard work, faltered Laura. Well, I don't know, Miss Comstock said doubtfully. Laura has considerable experience in cafeterias and restaurants, said Penny. I'm sure you'll find her both capable and willing. I might take you on trial basis, the woman told Laura. You'll start in at four dollars a week, board and room. But the advertisement said five dollars, Laura protested. Four dollars, take it or leave it. Later, if you're a hard worker and know how to mind your business, maybe I can raise you to five. Laura glanced despairingly at Louise and Penny and, ignoring their signals, said in a subdued voice, I guess I'll take it. Then, get into your work clothes right away, ordered Mrs. Comstock briskly. I'm in the middle of a big ironing. You can take over while I do my grocery buying. Before Laura could reply, footsteps were heard in the hallway. A short, pudgy man with alert, darting eyes entered the parlor. He glanced sharply at the girls. Who are they, Anna? He asked rudely. The new housemaid and some of her friends, his wife replied. We'll help you bring in your luggage, Laura, Penny said quickly. She and Louise carried the heavy suitcases to an upstairs room, which Miss Comstock assigned to Laura. It was a plainfully furnished chamber with an ugly wall and an uncomfortable bed. Laura, do you think you really wish to stay? Penny inquired. If I'm a judge of character, Mrs. Comstock will prove to be a hard taskmaster. Oh, I expect it, but I'll stick it out for a few weeks anyway. Penny glanced at Louise, wondering again if she should tell Laura what the cafe owner had said about the old mansion. Before she could speak, Mrs. Comstock's voice was heard from the foot of the stairway. Hurry and change your clothes. Miss Blair, she called. I want to get started at the ironing. I'll be right down, Laura promised. She changed her shoes and dress 
and then leaving Penny and Louise to unpack the suitcase for her, ran down to the kitchen. I believe we should wait around for an hour or so, declared Penny to her chum. Laura may change her mind and decide to return with us. Yes, I agree, Louise. Miss Comstock is starting out like a slave driver. It looks as if poor Laura will not have much free time for herself. I didn't care for her husband either, announced Penny. He acted so suspicious of us. Just his rude way, I imagine. They had finished hanging Laura's garments in the closet when Louise, who chanced to be near a window, noticed Mrs. Comstock going down the street, market basket in her arm. Feeling that the coast was clear, the two girls ran to the kitchen to talk with Laura. They discovered her hard at work at a huge basket of ironing. The sink was filled with overflowing with dirty dishes. I know I'll never make good here, Laura said anxiously. Mrs. Comstock expects me to finish the ironing, do the scrubbing, and the dishes before supper time. I can't possibly get half of it done. I should think not, exclaimed Penny indignantly. Mrs. Comstock should employ an octopus, not a mere human being. There's the, dis there's the dusting to do too, Laura added. We'll help you, Louise declared. I'll start in on the dishes. I wonder where old Comstock keeps her soap chips. Don't bother to look for them, advised Penny. You might know a woman of her frugal character wouldn't squander money on soap. She found a dust cloth in the cellar, and while Louise devoted herself to the dishes, began an energetic attack on the furniture. It was a tedious task, for the large room was crowded with massive pieces of bric-a-brac, and upon each wall hung countless numbers of paintings and portraits in heavy frames. Good afternoon, General, clowned Penny, making a mock bow before the picture of an ancient warlord. What a scowling old fellow you are, the Comstock temperament, no doubt. Would, gen would his generalship like to have his face wiped? As she dusted the painting, it occurred to her to wonder how Mr. and Mrs. Comstock had chanced to have so many. If the portraits had been done by worthwhile artists, she knew they must represent a fairly large sum of money. Yet the Comstocks had not impressed her as persons of interest in art. Doubtlessly, the pictures and the massive furniture had been handed down by more prosperous relatives. Penny dusted the lower floor and then went back to the kitchen where she wiped the dishes for Louise. Laura worked doggedly at the ironing, but the pile of clothes in the basket melted slowly. I'll never get through before dinner time, she declared nervously, glancing at the clock. Mrs. Comstock is due back here any minute. Why kill yourself trying, demanded Penny. The more I see of the place, the less I like it. I'd like to make a good impression, but these clothes are so hard to iron. They are wrinkled and dry. Laura reached upon the shelf for the ironing above the ironing board for a sprinkling glass, which stood there. Her arm brushed against the bottle of bluing left uncorked by Mrs. Comstock. Before Laura could prevent the disaster, the bottle upset and tumbled down on the ironing board. An ugly blue stain spread slowly over her white shirt. Oh, what have I done now? Laura cried in dismay. I've ruined one of Mr. Comstock's shirts. Now I'm certain to lose my job. Do, 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 do.